California, San Diego. Her research focused on investigating functional nanomaterials and energy storage and conversion by combining advanced characterization techniques and first principle simulation. With this, I would like to hand over the mic to Professor Shirley Mann. Thank you, Rosie. Can you see the full screen? Yes, I can. Um, Is it still full screen or? Surely for some reason we can see the next slide as well. How about now? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, so good morning to my colleagues in North America and uh, good evening uh, to colleagues in Europe. And also I see many uh, folks from uh, Asia are uh, also in the audience. Uh, thank you so much for uh, staying for the last talk. Uh, I want to first thank Rosie and Doron for the kind invitation. Uh, it's great to come here to talk a bit about our latest work. Um, I think that uh, uh, I, you know, there's a lot of excitement lately about uh, lithium metal anode as well as um, solid state batteries. So I would like to um, you know, follow up the excitement and uh, talk a few things about uh, uh, what uh, our group has been uh, busy with lately. Um, so I think for people know me that uh, last 20 years of my very short academic career, I have been focusing a lot to uh, build the multi-scale, multi-model characterization platform for the uh, battery community. Uh, early days, a lot of my work is on the uh, atomic level understanding of uh, how the uh, crystal structure or electronic structures change in the bulk of the battery materials. Uh, and then lately, I've been focusing a lot on single crystal particles, what are the defect generations, and uh, what are the uh, interface change on the surface of the particles. Uh, I think very recently, uh, a lot of people are going to see uh, techniques, characterization techniques that are much more focusing on larger scale, you know, for instance, the secondary particles of the uh, cathode or solid state electrolyte, and then more so uh, for lithium metal, a lot of time we're looking at the electrode level of the changes. So I want to point out that uh, <clears throat> early days, a lot of the characterization tools, uh, when we think about using uh, liquid electrolytes, <clears throat> The fact that we can evaporate the electrolyte make our job relatively easier. However, uh, I think that with solid state uh, uh, electro electrolyte, uh, we have a more challenging job. Uh, and also a lot of tools focusing on crystalline materials. And as we move towards uh, uh, solid state lithium metal, we deal with light elements and then we deal with a uh, lot of uh, materials are partially disorder or uh, not highly crystalline. And uh, I want to also emphasize that uh, um, a lot of the characterization tools must move uh, towards quantification. I think it's becoming increasingly important that we need to have characterization tools uh, that can tell us, you know, uh, correlate very well with electrochemistry if we're seeing Coulombic efficiency 99% versus 99.9% .9 how the characterization tools can enable us to quantify the differences uh, between the last 0.1% differences. Um, so the value of the highly sensitive tools have already been reviewed in the last 10 years. This is one of the first work uh, we have done in about 10 years ago uh, to use aberration corrected scanning transmission electron microscopy to study some of the high voltage cathode materials. Uh, the pristine materials is perfectly layered, but after high voltage exposure, the surface two to three nanometer can have uh, very significant phase changes, which lead to the impedance growth as well as the uh, gassing issues uh, on the cathode side, because you can actually see from the EO spectra that the oxygen loss is one of the major uh, problems for some of the high voltage cathode materials. Uh, I want to show this is because that uh, those uh, microscopy tools 
uh, works very well with the cathode materials because those materials are much less beam sensitive. Uh, today, because we are trying to understand light elements such as lithium metal, uh, we have actually a quite significant challenge here. Uh, one of the uh, development in the last three years in our field is to think about how we can actually visualize lithium metal. So you can see on on the right hand side, early days, a lot of the pictures of the lithium metal looks like this. Uh, if I joke about it, you can see an elephant in this picture, I think you can make it up if there's elephant inside of the picture. Uh, however, I think that uh, uh, thanks to our colleagues in the biology side, uh, there is cryogenic transmission electron microscopy. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, the workflow, how do you transfer the samples? is still a debatable topic. Some people directly uh, freeze plunge the lithium metal into the liquid nitrogen. Uh, some of us using uh, inert air transfer. So I think I won't spend the time on this. I just want to emphasize that, uh, you know, what's, why cryogenic imaging is so exciting is because uh, in the early days, you think about a lithium whisker, you can actually count how much electrons you're using to image this picture. And you can see by doing nothing, there is no biasing, no other external stimulants, the lithium metal whiskers already moved and changed. This is because those lithium metal are typically surrounded by SEI, and which is insulating. Therefore, um, so if, you know, you can think about uh, if it's a metallic, a pure metallic phase, it's trans, uh, we won't have this such a serious problems as in the beam sensitivity. But because this lithium whisker is not that conductive, you actually see very serious beam induced changes. The entire change here is due to the electronic, uh, the electron beam. But in the cryogenic conditions, we actually can afford to spend more time on the lithium whisker and we can actually get this kind of high resolution image of lithium metal. Of course, everybody should say lithium is BCC, that's correct. But, you know, they enable us to see a lot of the interfacial phenomena in the lithium metal. So um, the cryogenic imaging is really relying on the progress of the microscopy hardware because some of the cameras today can take a few thousand pictures per second and you can actually use very limited number of electrons to form beautiful beautiful images like this so um, you know let's think about uh, you know this progress of the uh, our field for future generation of the batteries right so generation zero lithium metal is indeed being studied 40 plus years ago uh, oftentimes I will tell my students why are we ready to tackle a problem that is 40 plus years old. Uh, I think that the answer really lies on two main points in my opinion. One is the tools that I have just uh, told you. Besides the cryogenic uh, TEM, many people have uh, uh, built new tools to study beam sensitive materials. Uh, our group, uh, the other effort is to try to enable cryogenic fibbing of the lithium metal because this is one of the key enabling techniques for us to see the microstructure differences in the lithium metal. Um, if you don't do cryogenic imaging, gallium ions actually, gallium atoms actually alloy with lithium at room temperature at very, very fast kinetics. So uh, we have to take care of that because the morphological change, a lot of it is induced by the gallium lithium alloy. And the development of the FIB is continue, continuing. What I showed you here is already a couple years old. So in the new era of uh, cutting of the three-dimensional uh, structure of lithium metal, we can actually use argon, we can use xenon. There are many other upcoming new exciting tools that will enable us to actually um, lock in the pristine state of the deposit the electrochemical deposit the lithium. The second very important thing that I believe that enable us to tackle a 40 plus year old problem is really the progress of electrolytes. Uh, I think people have seen many in the literature that the 
carbonate, what we call the Gen2 electrolyte, typically deposit this kind of highly porous uh, structure of lithium. But you know, with the progress of new salts, such as lithium TFSI, or even combination of lithium FSI with lithium TFSI, the morphology or the microstructure of the lithium has already changed. And even more excitingly, I think uh, recently, both in Asia and North America, the uh, new electrolyte development and Europe, the new electrolyte development for highly localized concentrated electrolytes for liquefied gas electrolyte, we can actually um, we can actually um, deposit the lithium metal that is highly, highly dense that in the tomography by the cryofib, you can see only less than 1% of the uh, porosities in the deposit the lithium metal. So uh, this is where I want to uh, emphasize that uh, the breakthrough in the electrolytes enable us to go from the columbic efficiency increase from 98% to 99.6%. Uh, I think that uh, several groups have reported that uh, really, really uh, groundbreaking high numbers of the uh, columbic efficiencies. So uh, because of those progress, I think the Battery 500 earlier this year released the latest progress update and showing the entire field that it is possible to build lithium metal anode batteries uh, in the two amp power cell. So here we use very thin lithium supply, lithium anode, 40 micrometer only, and lean electrolyte. So the measurement of the uh, uh, energy density is on the entire cell, uh, including packaging tabs and everything. So this is absolutely exciting, but I want to point out that it really anchors, the progress really anchors our uh, in-depth understanding of what's going on in the lithium metal anode. Uh, in the carbonate electrolyte, we often uh, deposit this kind of morphology of the lithium metal. In the many of the new electrolytes, uh, including the high polarized concentrated electrolyte, uh, you can actually see that uh, the, morpho the microstructure morphology of the lithium metal fundamentally changed from the carbonate electrolyte. And our hypothesis is that if you have this kind of highly whisker, very high aspect ratio, high torturosity lithium metal uh, deposited on the current collector, you actually run into the challenge of this possible uh, dead lithium formation. And uh, I think the entire field now recognize the importance of the dead lithium. Now, the tools or the uh, characterization tools we have been designing is the ability to quantify how much of this uh, loss is actually due to the uh, dead lithium of metallic lithium because you can see, you know, if this is happening, this lithium surrounded by the SEI is detached from the electronic pathway. So this lithium cannot be electrochemically uh, participating in the battery reactions because of this uh, incident. Uh, so the tools uh, I want to say is that, you know, of course, cryo-TEM play a major role in our studies, but those tools are very localized and we always run into the issues of sample statistics. You can see clearly morphology differences uh, in the uh, concentrated electrolyte versus the traditional carbonated electrolytes. And it seems to echo with our hypothesis, but how to quantify, this is where uh, we actually decided to build a new setup that use the unique property of the SEI components and the metallic lithium, because majority of the SEI components, they are either soluble in the water or uh, they react with water, give out gas such as carbon dioxide, methane gas. Uh, as far as we know, lithium hydride and the uh, metallic lithium are the only two species that will give you uh, hydrogen. Uh, so using this very simple principle, we actually designed this titration gas chromatography to quantify how much is the inactive metallic lithium and how much is the SEI. And the calibration, of course, is extremely important. I want to emphasize the uh, 
chromatography method, you must do calibration very, very carefully. And the other important thing I want to mention is that chromatography method can enable us to have the lithium detection limit up to down to uh, nanogram of lithium metal. So the sensitivity of this tool is also really, really important because we're trying to capture very, very small amount of uh, uh, lithium metal. So what we did was the eight different electrolytes that uh, uh, offered to us by uh, Army Research Lab, Pacific Northwestern, and the General Motors. Uh, all the eight electrolytes, they have covered a variety of first cycle columbic efficiency. So our initial study uh, really is focusing on the first cycle. And to our very surprise, uh, we actually see that the uh, columbic efficiency for the first cycle, at least, uh, has perfect correlations with this is the total capacity loss. This is the hydrogen measured that we de deduce how much metallic lithium are there. It's in perfect correlation. While the SEI is actually present, always present, but we do not see a dependence of the SEI uh, based on the different electrolyte. So in the literature, we always see that uh, the uh, SEI is considered as the culprit of the low columbic efficiency of the lithium metal battery. So we hope that the studies uh, try to provoke the field to think about perhaps, uh, you know, in the um, low columbic efficiency region, SEI is not the main reason. Uh, please don't uh, take it as SEI is not important. SEI is absolutely important. I think for the last 0.4 or 0.3%, uh, we will all be playing the game of how to optimize the SEI. Um, now, I think uh, uh, after we uh, recognize that importance, uh, my postdoc Chen Chen Fang, who's now a professor in uh, Michigan State, uh, studied these uh, uh, using the pressure as the knob. So you've seen uh, Professor Neil Desgupta's previous talk, lithium really behaves like a polymer. So if we uh, recognize this unique property of the lithium, then stack pressure is obviously a very efficient tuning knob for lithium metal. So in what this study, what we did is we identified the critical stack pressure where you can actually deposit the ideal structure. So I have shown cartoon structures of those large granular columnar structure of lithium metal. It can be done in the uh, electrolyte with uh, special salts or special solvent. And we have shown uh, each of the scale bar here is actually uh, in the middle panel is about uh, uh, four, three to four micron. We're depositing 20 micron thick uh, lithium metal. And you can actually maintain a very, very nice uh, columnar microstructure. And pressure is such an important tuning knob for lithium metal batteries. Uh, this is also confirmed by our uh, collaborator using molecular dynamics to study the mechanical behavior of the electrochemically deposited lithium. And for more details, you can find uh, in our archived articles. Uh, my main point to try to emphasize here is that uh, once we understand the physical uh, properties of the lithium metal uh, and recognize its unique physical properties, uh, we can utilize uh, pressure as a very effective tuning knob uh, for high efficiency uh, lithium metal uh, deposition. The second thing I want to really point out is that uh, during the TGC uh, development, we recognized something very interesting uh, because when we deposited this whiskers of lithium metal in the carbonate electrolyte, we found that the surface, we can see very nice crystalline SEI. However, in the center of the whisker, in the very beginning of the deposition, we can hardly find any metallic signals of the lithium metal. Um, that actually uh, confused us for more than three years until we had a collaboration with uh, Professor Bo Yan Liao's group with Dr. Gora Pawa. Uh, and uh, they performed some very interesting reactive molecular dynamics. So what you he see here is that uh, uh, this is a, a crystal with all, only 700 atoms. Uh, you can see the blue ones is the lithium that has the BCC 
local structures, and the white ones are the lithium that uh, are much more glassy, and we couldn't actually detect a very very strong, uh, you know, uh, BCC crystalline. Uh, crystallinity of the lithium metal. So this actually lead us a whole series of systematic studies uh, where we found that uh, depend if you have the same current density, you deposit a different time, you can actually see a very uh, interesting uh, glassy to crystalline transition. And the same applies if you actually go from low critical current density to high critical current density. In a high current density case, uh, with very short time, you can form crystal lithium. But in the uh, low current density case, it takes very long time for us to discover, you know, three to five nanometer uh, size lithium crystalline uh, particles. So what this imply is actually a very important point I want to uh, emphasize is that uh, uh, in order for us to raise the critical current density for the lithium metal, people always talk about wettability. And I want to challenge the field to think about what is the lithium that is deposited. And we believe that the uh, non-perfect crystallinity of those lithium metal that deposited is the key for enabling uh, a very high critical current density, and we must find the true answers of what is the uh, glass to crystalline uh, transformation. This kinetics is extremely important for us to understand so that we can enable true uh, reversible uh, lithium metal batteries. Um, now, uh, the last few minutes of my presentation, since you know we're doing lithium metal, I thought that uh, I want to spend a little bit time to say the next step after lithium metal, a lot of people are excited about the solid state batteries. Uh, me too, I'm excited, but you know I also want to uh, emphasize that uh, uh, as a scientist in the field, we must be realistic of looking at uh, some of the challenges. There's a lot of advantages. There is no doubt that uh, uh, the excitement of the solid state battery is, uh, you know, justified. Uh, you know, one of the magic trick my students play is, you know, you can cut the batteries and there is no uh, safety incident. Uh, however, um, I think uh, now let me dive into uh, the things that I would like, I know there's a lot of young researchers in the field uh, or currently listening to the talk. Uh, I think of what excites me most in the solid state battery is the science that we are able to do uh, because it's all solid state. It provides us a platform where we will have opportunities to develop a new scientific tools for understanding the fundamental science. Uh, I think to quote uh, uh, Professor Whittingham's uh, remark for our special issue in the chemical review, I want everybody to uh, you know, understand that there's still a lot of reaction mechanisms, kinetics issues in the solid state batteries that we need to understand. So come back to my favorite topics of the interfacial phenomena. Uh, in the liquid case, I think uh, we think we have a pretty good understanding. However, you know, uh, I understand that the graphite, even graphite is not fully understand, understood yet. But at least in the liquid uh, electrolyte, we have a pretty decent models that uh, enable us to think about what is the SEI, what is the CEI, and how we uh, tackle the issues in the uh, graphite, silicon, lithium metal, and then the NMC or LFP, all those uh, cathode materials. Now in the solid state electrolyte, particularly the sulfide based electrolyte, I found it very fascinating because the electrolyte is not even chemically compatible with the anode and the cathode. Right. When I say chemically, I mean if you mix the sulfide electrolyte with the NMC cathode, it will actually chemically react. So that's the first challenge that the field was able to overcome. And after that, we have these huge issues about the SEI and the CEI. And in our chemical review paper, we also detailed a lot of the interfacial phenomena. So we go from 10 years ago, think about uh, there is no SEI in solid state, to today's understanding that there are so many actual interfaces in the solid state batteries. 
I think our field has moved a lot. We've made a lot of progress. And some of those reactions are understood, right? So for instance, on the cathode side, uh, where we understand that the NMC cathode or um, NCA cathode must be protected when we actually have it in contact with the sulfide-based electrolyte. And the common coating materials, uh, you know, the most exciting example people always use is lithium niobates. You know, coat and uncoat, you can have drastically different electrochemical performances, and the coating don't have to be thick. It, pretty thin. It's most importantly is to be uniform. And my colleague, Professor Xue Bing Ong, has done a lot of uh, calculations and he gave us some candidates and borates work perfectly. And we will have a paper coming out uh, with uh, LG Chem on the lithium borates uh, protection for the cathode materials. It works as well as the lithium niobates materials. So we did make some very good progress on the understanding of the interfaces in the solid state battery. But let me talk a little bit about the challenges. Okay, so Did you already you... seen Professor Desgupta's talk. There's a lot of issues with the lithium dendrites. And I, from my perspective, uh, the characterization is actually one of the major challenges, particularly if we want to correlate quantitatively with electrochemical data. So um, I think that uh, many researchers in the field are developing uh, methods, including Professor Eugen Yannick, Professor Linda Neza. Uh, we all have contributed to this field of um, trying to understand the you know, dendrite formation interface. The issue is really is a buried interface. The interface is buried inside the solid. We, there is no way we can evaporate the solid state electrolyte. So uh, we also think about uh, you know uh, our colleagues in the industry. For instance, solid power is already able to develop a really really nice stack of uh, solid state all solid state. Uh, batteries and they are actually doing two amp hour prototypes already. But if you think about the characterization challenges, because it's such thick layer of all solid state, I think we are facing some really uh, huge issues of how to quantify uh, those uh, solid state um, uh, interfaces. Right. So um, yeah, I think uh, since I'm running out of time, uh, I won't dive deeper into the uh, 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 characterization tools for solid state. I do want to emphasize that uh, this is a very rich field. So uh, students and young folks who are starting to do research in this area realize that uh, new electrolyte is still being discovered. I want to point here, you know, the chloride uh, based electrolyte discovered less than two years ago already surpass my expectations for what halides can do. And this is really, really exciting. And I expect that there will be new exciting things happening in perovskite, in having nitride, uh, you know. Uh, so if you took a look at the progress of the solid state electrolyte, I think we're somewhere here where we are able to understand the interfacial stabilities. We try to do more on the mechanical stability side, but there's still a long way long road ahead of us and it will require everybody's contributions to think about how we can have the solid state electrolyte processable, scalable, and ultimately if we start building solid state batteries, we don't want to build like what we build with lithium ion batteries because now we're trying to figure out the recycling. We should actually design our solid state batteries for the future recyclability and sustainability. So with that, uh, let me finish the talk. Um, I think uh, that uh, uh, the work on solid state uh, batteries and lithium metal really started a decade ago and we had a lot of support from the basic science division for developing those tools, which enabled us to use in the applied programs like Battery 500. We're also extremely grateful. I'm extremely grateful to all my students and the postdocs. Uh, all of them now, I mean, these three are professors now, and uh, Tom is in the uh, Berkeley lab. Um, so I think that uh, our collaborators, my colleagues, and uh, also our industry and the national lab sponsors, um, I think with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer questions.
Thanks, Julie. So there are two questions. Please proceed to answer them. Sure. I'll read the question first. The first question is by, oh, it's anonymous, sorry. Okay. Why does lithium metal perform better at a slow charge and a fast discharge compared to slow charge slash slow discharge? I think this is a very good question. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, the kinetics of the pure metallic lithium in the electrolyte, in, for instance, carbonate electrolyte, is very, very good. Very, very fast. Right? Now, the SEI plays a role at how when you're depositing, because you have to deposit the SEI as well. When you are stripping, many of the SEI components are not reversible. So you're only stripping lithium metal. So I think that plays a role for the asymmetric behavior of the lithium metal, but uh, I don't have more details to tell you right now. Uh, I think this is a very, very good observation and we should definitely pay more attention to that, how to also enable fast charging. So in fact, in our pressure paper, uh, I believe pressure will be one of the enabling knob for the fast charging of the lithium metal. The second question uh, is, uh, can control dendrites and SEI layer by gel type anode materials? Uh, I think that uh, um, it's possible. I believe that uh, uh, the three dimensional current collector for lithium metal is one of the effective way to improve the critical current density. So as you know, you know, typical lithium metal can even sustain 10 milliamp per centimeter square. Most of the lithium metal cells we currently handle at room temperature, even for our latest archived paper, we can only do 4 milliamp per centimeter square. If we want to go 10 milliamp, yeah, I think that uh, it's possible that we need to think about the smarter design of the anode side. And I don't uh, exclude the possibility of using some polymer gels. Uh, all right, third question is, uh, uh, what is your opinion, which type of solid electrolyte we should focus on for high energy and high cycle life for solid state batteries? Uh, I, I believe my life, my research experience is a good example to show, do not pick the winner too early, right? If you think about the sulfide electrolyte, Nobody wants to touch it, except for our colleague in Japan, Japan. They are very persistent on the sulfide electrolyte because we are focusing on the science. There's exciting science to be done. And when a breakthrough occurred, now it seems that the sulfides and halides are progressing very, very fast. And then we have challenges with the polymer, with the oxides. So I think that uh, I will not pick the winner that early because uh, there's a lot of science still yet to be done. Okay, um, what could be the optimum thickness of solid electrolyte? Uh, this one, if we consider energy density, 10 micrometer. This is our ultimate goal is to go for 10 micrometer, like a separator. I think that, uh, uh, I think that's the ultimate goal. I think today, many, uh, uh, groups, uh, many um, R&D groups that can actually reach 20 to 30 micrometer with very good mechanical and, uh, and uh, ionic transport properties. Uh, I think somebody asked me, uh, have you also combined EOS with cryo-TEM? Yes, absolutely. I think with the modern microscope, Imaging and spectroscopy can be taken with very limited dose of electrons. Even EOS, they have built new machineries or new hardwares that can enable you to get very good signal to noise ratio with low dosage. So I think that uh, uh, definitely there will be more data coming out where the electron energy loss spectroscopy uh, image will be together with the imaging of the uh, uh, SEI or light elements. Shirley? Yeah. I think I'll yeah. step in with a question if I'm allowed. Um, and it's a really off the wall question, but I was intrigued by the glassy lithium. And I'm wondering if you've done any modeling studies to look at what the lithium self diffusion coefficient is, because as you know, it's actually pretty low in crystalline lithium. 
Do you have any sense of what it might be in glassy? Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, I think uh, Professor Boyan, Dr. Boyan Liao will have the number. Um, I don't remember, but uh, I think that what we found is that uh, the uh, diffusion, I mean, the self diffusion of the lithium, e even, even in the crystalline materials in the simulation and the amorphous lithium in the simulation, they're both very fast. I don't know why experimentally it was measured so slow. So there's no real difference between the crystal and, and glassy? Uh, not quantity, qualitatively different. So of course the glassy one that is much more mobile, that's, that is absolutely true at a low temperature particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I also, we, are cha we will challenge the experimentally measured self-diffusivity numbers because I believe there is a paper uh, on you know using micro electrode to study the kinetics of lithium stripping, uh, those kinetic number is extremely fast. So I think we have our field has a discrepancy to to resolve here. Um, I, I think that the lithium metal is really extremely mobile at room temperature. There isn't really in it. I don't have a clear answer, but I think, <clears throat> yeah. I think the experimental numbers need to be re-looked at. Do you know which year the self-diffusivity was measured? Oh God, that number has been around for so long. I don't even remember. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons I think we might to re-look at the, some of the measurement experiments because mm -hmm. in computation, in simulation, the numbers are pretty high actually. Okay. There's other questions coming in the chat. So maybe we can chat offline sometime because there's more questions to answer. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that uh, some people ask me about uh, uh, quantum scale. <laughs> quantum scale. <laughs> I, I cannot uh, comment on that. I only can say that, uh, yeah, I wish, I, I sincerely hope they will have a product uh, by 2025. <laughs> okay, so. Um, yeah, I think that uh, the good uh, scientific question here is, is there any probability of dead lithium to reconnect and become active lithium? Absolutely. That's why I encourage all the mechanical engineers to think smartly about how to tune pressure because I want to emphasize the pressure I showed you here is only a few hundred kilopascal. So it's much, much less than solid state batteries that we usually use over megapascal. So I believe that we have an opportunity here. So some people see this as a challenge, right? Because if you want to tune pressure, you know, it's a, not the standard lithium batteries. But I think, you know, once we start to go for a new chemistry, uh, we should take this as an opportunity. Is there a way we can tune pressure? And also, I believe that uh, companies already using methods such as pulse current, you know, special ways to actually um, activate that lithium. So I think that uh, uh, just to remind everyone, if we want to do this, let's do it systematically and scientifically. We should not be only focusing on, you know, getting longer cycle numbers for the lithium metal. Uh, then I think the question about uh, what would be a good design SEI for sulfide electrolytes if lithium is the anode? Um, that's a very good question. Um, in fact, until today, I think that uh, uh, lithium metal is our headache for the sulfide <laughs> electrolytes. Uh, I think that uh, there are ways to stabilize that interface, but the critical current density is always very, very low, you know. Uh, so I, I know there are answers, but I unfortunately cannot disclose it. But I think that, uh, uh, you know, hopefully the person who asked the question could think deeper about uh, uh, what are the, you know, typical good SEI component, lithium oxide, lithium uh, fluoride, lithium Li3, N, lithium nitride, nitride, uh, nitride, I guess. Uh, you know, those are the good solid electrolyte interface. Uh, I think Li2S is not that bad as well. So we need to think about how to stabilize lithium anode. It's possible. Uh, I think that uh, uh, high rate performances is- the, way, the questions will keep on coming. Can we oh, sorry. Yeah, I should close the session? Okay. 
<laughs> thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, and I would like to thank you all the panelists for this long, hectic day, but with wonderful and enriching talks. We stick to our coming day. Uh, you all will be having much more to listen tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.